Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Thomas Jefferson, and the focus is George Washington's cabinet. The year is 1789. Jefferson has just returned from France, where he's been serving for the last five years as the American minister. He felt it was time to bring his daughters home, to re-enroll them in an American school, and then he was going to turn around and head right back to France and get back to work. Except when he lands in Norfolk, he picks up a newspaper and he finds out that he has been nominated for a new position. President George Washington, who is getting his administration up and running, has picked Jefferson to be his first Secretary of State. Jefferson initially doesn't really want the job. He wants to go back to France. He, he, the France is in the midst of a tumult, its own revolution, and he has connections there. He has passion. He wants to engage. But when Washington sends a messenger directly to Jefferson with a personal entreaty for him to join the cabinet, Jefferson cannot say no. And so he agrees he will become the country's first Secretary of State. He doesn't arrive in the capital of New York until March of 1790. It's almost a year after the rest of the government has been getting up and running. And he quickly gets engaged with his cabinet members. And this includes a couple of folks who had fought with Washington in the Revolutionary War. You've got Henry Knox, who's now the Secretary of War. Alexander Hamilton is now the Secretary of the Treasury. And Edmund Randolph is the Attorney General. Randolph was a friend of Washington's from Virginia. And of course, Jefferson as his Secretary of State. Jefferson feels very much like a fish out of water. First of all, he's been gone from the country for several years, but now he's in the, in the capital, and all he seems to hear about in his conversations, both in the government and around town, is about this new, strong, central government, which is not really what he got into the re rebellion uh, business in the first place for. It's kind of anathema, his beliefs around individual liberty and states' rights. And he's concerned about it. He makes the comment, I cannot describe the wonder and mortification with which the table conversations filled me. Politics were the chief topic and a preference of kingly over Republican government was evidently the favorite sentiment. An apostate I could not be, nor yet a hypocrite. And I found myself for the most part, the only advocate on the Republican side of the equation. Well, he did have a friend in town, James Madison, who was a like-minded Republican from Virginia. Madison was serving in the first version of the House of Representatives. He also had his close friend, John Adams, who he had served very, very closely with uh, during their time together overseas. But while they bonded personally, Jefferson and Adams were very different politically. And Adams does something early in the term. He's the vice president of the United States serving as the president of the Senate. And he believed after his time in Europe that the United States need, needed to have a robust title for the president to sort of be on par with the leaders from Europe. And so he throws in a couple of ideas, gets a committee together, and the Senate committee comes up with His Highness, the President of the United States and Protector of Their Liberties. Thomas Jefferson read that and he said it's the most superlatively ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Jefferson and Adams would have their ups and downs throughout the rest of their lives, at times completely estranged, at times very, very close, but politically it's clear that they are growing further and further apart. Well, Jefferson found that he was apart from a lot of people in the Capitol, including those in the cabinet. President Washington believed in getting all of his counselors around to give him advice really on any topic, not just in their own particular lane, just like he did during the Revolutionary War when all of his generals would come to the table in a council of war, give him advice, he'd make the decision. He was going to do the same thing here as president of the United States. Jefferson and Hamilton are diametrically opposed on almost every topic. Hamilton, the strongest advocate for a firm central government, whereas Jefferson is again all about individual liberty, states' rights, and they differ on, on pretty much every topic that comes to the table. Starting with the Assumption Bill. Hamilton's economic plan started with trying to gain additional credit for the United States, and he was going to do it by having the federal government assume the outstanding Revolutionary War debts of the individual states. He thought this was good economics. Jefferson was very much opposed. He thought it was a power grab, something that the federal government could then hold over the states uh, in, in a balance of power kind of scenario, and he was very much against. Well, the government was still figuring out sort of how it works. 
how do you get bills passed? Is there a nature of compromise? And so Jefferson and Hamilton actually meet on the streets of New York, and they agree to have a dinner at Jefferson's house. Madison comes along for, for participation as well, and they actually end up with a compromise that gets Jefferson and Madison supporting Hamilton's assumption bill, but they get something in return. They wanted the capital. The Constitution says that Congress has the power, the authority, to decide where the seat of government was going to be permanently located, and Jefferson and Madison wanted it in the South. Well, Hamilton agrees to support that if he can get Madison and Congress to support his assumption bill, and that's exactly what happens. All seems good. The new American experiment, compromise, is working. But Jefferson has buyer's remorse almost immediately. He feels like he gave up way much more than he got, and frankly, he vows he's not going to compromise with Hamilton or anyone else ever again. The next piece of legislation that had this same kind of conflict came later that year, and again, part of Hamilton's economic plan. He wanted to establish a Bank of the United States. Jefferson, again, was completely against. This is another power grab, centralizing power within the federal government, and moreover, he said it is unconstitutional. There is nothing in the Constitution that says that the Congress, the federal government, can charter any corporation, let alone a bank. Well, this is, again, a constitutional question that Hamilton counters with the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution, which says that Congress has the authority to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Well, phrases like this were, again, at the heart of the disagreement between Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton is a loose constructionist. He wants a broad interpretation that lets the federal government potentially do anything it wants. Jefferson's the opposite because he fears that. He fears the tyrannical element of a federal government unconstrained, and he wants a strict reading of the Constitution which would say no bank. George Washington sides with Hamilton, as he usually does, and the bank is established. Jefferson despises these personal interactions. He says it's being like daily pitted in the cabinet like two cocks in a cockfight, and this is anathema to Jefferson. He likes to get along, and if he's going to take shots at people, maybe he'll do it in writing. Well, let's talk about the in writing, because there is plenty of battles between the cabinet members that takes place not in front of each other, but through the pen. Hamilton is constantly writing essays that are printed in the papers under a pseudonym that are attacking Jefferson's beliefs and Jefferson personally. Jefferson is a little more sly about it because he's hired somebody by the name of Philip Freneau to be a translator in the State Department. But what really he wanted in Freneau was someone who could stand up an oppositional newspaper. In this case, it's called the National Gazette. And Freneau, for the rest of Washington's term, is attacking, criticizing the Washington administration, Hamilton in particular, Jefferson can honestly claim he's not writing anything, but he has the man in place to do exactly his bidding, and he's perfectly content with the criticisms that Furneaux is running in, into Washington and Hamilton's direction. Washington is at his wit's end. He's trying to get his senior advisors to get on the same page. He writes both of them letters, but frankly, it falls in deaf ears because Hamilton and Jefferson are simply not agreeing practically on anything, well, except one thing. The one thing they agreed on was that Washington needed to continue to serve. The only time it seems like that they came together was to convince Washington late in his first term he cannot retire. The country's too fragile, sir. We need you to run again. Washington eventually agrees. But in the midst of this, the disagreements continue. And the biggest at this point is not domestically, but internationally. And it has to do with Britain and France. Britain and France are at war. France is in its own revolution as well, trying to figure out what its future is going to be. A lot of tumult, again, in, in, across, the, in, across the path. And President Washington has been advised, what side is he going to come down on? How is the United States going to engage? And Jefferson is pushing and advocating to be an ally of France. They had supported the United States in the American Revolution. The U.S. owed it to the French to support them in return. Besides, there was this push amongst the people in France right now to try to drive toward a more of a democratic republic. And again, this was a kinship that Jefferson felt the Americans should follow and support France. Well, Washington wasn't so sure. Frankly, he saw France as in chaos. And he and Hamilton were aligned that the treaty that they had was with the old government of France, not this new government. So Washington decides the best policy for the United States was neutrality. 
We had to look out for our own interest. We're going to stay out of this. And Jefferson is really crushed by this because he really firmly believed that the United States should be coming to the aid of France. He's starting to lose his energy because fighting every day is, is again, not something that appeals very much to him. And so by the end of the first year of Washington's second term, this is 1793, he's basically done. And he's ready to retire, head back to, head back to Monticello. He's, he's distraught. He feels the administration has been a monarchical betrayal of the spirit of 76, the Declaration of Independence, his declaration, the whole idea of state sovereignty, his ally or the country's ally in France, just feels like this administration has shoved all that aside. He's ready to go home and retire. Although he does tell President Washington that he may not retire quietly. He says in a letter, I will not suffer my retirement to be clouded by the slanders of a man whose history, from the moment at which history can stoop to notice him, is a tissue of machinations against the liberty of the country, which is not only received and given him bread, but heaped its honors on his head. Obviously talking about Alexander Hamilton. Well, what would Jefferson end up doing in his retirement for the cabinet? Well, in fact, he becomes the full-throated leader of the opposition. But that's the story for another day. That is Thomas Jefferson and George Washington's cabinet from the life of Thomas Jefferson. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.